Hello everyone and welcome to the series called Paint. This is episode number five. We're talking about the underpainting in this video. The underpainting, as we saw, uh, is the beginning of the actual work on the surface. We start to put paint on that surface uh, according to our ideas. So it's a very interesting stage. I want to begin this video with a consideration uh, of the painting Ecce Homo by Antonello da Messina. This is uh, the painting that I have chosen to use for this lesson or video. And the depiction is a part of the last evening and the morning before the crucifixion of Christ, Jesus Christ. If we follow the gospel and see the events, we can see that the first event was the Last Supper, uh, instituting the sacrament of communion and predicting the betrayal by Judas Iscarius, Iscariot. Secondly, there is the prayer at Gethsemane. Jesus retreats to the garden to pray. Then he is betrayed by Judas, actually in front of the uh, religious authorities. He's identified and brought to the temple or the synod of the temple. He is tried before the high priest. Uh, he endures a trial before Caiaphas. He is accused of blasphemy. At that point, we can see Peter's denial three times. This is in fulfillment of Jesus' prediction. Then there is a trial uh, by the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, where Pilate finds no fault, but he succumbs to the crowd and to the crucifixion. Then there is a scourging. Pilate orders Christ to be scourged. There is mockery. The soldiers place a crown of thorns on his head and then he is taken to be crucified on Golgotha. So we are between the seventh and the eighth point and this is the point where we see in the King James Version John chapter 19 verse 5 then came Jesus forth bearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe I didn't mention that <clears throat> purple is the sign of royalty and Pilate saith unto them behold the man now behold the man in Latin is ecce homo here is the man. Behold the man. So, Antonello da Messina is focusing on this particular moment. And here we see one of his first... Uh, this is a surviving painting, okay? It's really important that you understand that painters, uh, 1463, probably you know, painted many other images that were lost. So we can only imagine that these paintings we can see and we can testify, but there may be more. This is the first one, 1463, and uh, this is in New York City. Here's another painting uh, done not too many years after. 1470, small painting um, in Genova, different expression. And uh, here is another, the same year. This is the painting that I am using. I was saying, it's not a copy, it's it's a exercise, an exercise, um, an av aversion, my version. And this is a copy that is at the New York City Metropolitan Museum. Uh, and there's another one, 1475. This is in Piacenza at uh, the Collegio 
alberoni and uh, different expression a little bit more dramatic and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, oil on wood another one christ at the column very similar it's not exactly ecce homo homo but uh, it's the last one 18 uh, 1478 this is at the paris louvre now what i can say about these paintings they're they're like icons in a way these are uh, very small they're probably devotional some of them are a little bit larger uh, and probably they're made for adoration it's similar for me to a icon I think of it as an icon something that uh, a type of painting that is done for really for religious purposes not just a illustration of a point in time but uh, something that goes beyond the appearance and becomes something that is devotional and why is this interesting for me well apart from the fact of the spiritual entity the frontal portraiture is really interesting for me uh, the fact that it's so frontal so uh, really direct the facial expression is extremely interesting the eyes and there is a clarity of chiaroscuro for the project that I think is very very interesting and so this is uh, the reason or let's say a little bit of the history of why this particular painting I'm in the studio now and I've allowed the drawing the painting to dry very very well I think it's been three days now and it's very solid the 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 white is solid but it's flat okay I've done a little bit of drawing I'm going to let you see uh, how solid it is and just some drawings for the head we're going to do all of the the work of the um, the face the first thing I'm going to show you is how to make this mixture uh, with the egg white. Okay, we didn't do that in the last video, so I thought I would show you how to do that. So I have my brushes. I have uh, the green paint that I'm going to use for the underpainting, the palette knife, and the egg mixture. Okay, there's a little bit of turpentine in here, and so I'll show you how to uh, make the white mixture. I just need a little bit. I'm not going to make much. to keep the green inside the figure so I'll start to have a little bit of a border between the background and the figure
you see there's a lot of build up here and I just want to flatten it. By flattening it, it will become less white. The most white is where it's built up very, very well. But here I'm flattening it. And so it mixes. I can also use the dark green to go back and correct the drawing. For example, these eyes, you know, I can make those darker. Verde que te quiero verde. Verde viento, verde rama. El barco sobre la mar. El caballo en la montaña con la sombra en la cintura Ella sueña en su baranda verde carne, pelo verde, ojos de fría plata Bajo la luna gitana las cosas la están mirando Y ella no puede mirarlas Verde que te quiero, verde compadre quiero cambiar Caballo por su casa, mi montura por su espejo, mi cuchillo por su manta, compadre, vengo sangrando desde los puertos de Cabra. Compadre, quiero morir, deceptenme de mi cama, de acero si puede ser, con las sábanas de la mano de ella y la que tengo. Del pecho a la garganta, 300 rosas morenas, lleva tu pechera blanca, tu sangre rezuma y huele alrededor de tu faja. Ya suben los dos compadres hacia las altas barandas, dejando un rastro de sangre, dejando un rastro de lágrimas, temblaban los tejados, farolillos. Ojalata, mil panderos de cristal Hería la madrugada Suben los dos compadres Hacia las altas barandas Dejando un rastro de sangre Dejando un rastro de lágrimas Temblaban los tejados Farolillos de hojalata Mil panderos de cristal Hería la madrugada Okay, the last thing I want to do is the 
background uh, just to give a different idea of the background. I'm going to make the background a this video with a little bit of information about the Kabbalah that we have been following also uh, the phases the different phases I have been talking about the phase of Chokmah and the second phase going into the phase of Hasadim and Chokmah is wisdom Hasadim uh, is understanding the Phases come from this light, this love. There is, a, in the creation of this light, it's like an ethereal state. Uh, everything is there. And this was the idea that I wanted to express about inspiration. Everything is there in the inspiration. So slowly we are solidifying this inspiration and what is important is the desire, the desire to create. This becomes very important for the artist and that signifies a kind of a different stage. So we're moving from the creator to the create creature, the creature or the created being, which could be metaphorically symbolized by the painting. We have this essence that is creating for the pleasure, for the pleasure, pure pleasure of the creation, love, giving everything, giving all this light. And in the same way, the painter is attempting to inject upon this surface, this kind of love, this inner light. And uh, we have the, um, this desire is solely in the first state to pass on to uh, other people. So there is a altruistic reason for doing this. We don't do it for ourselves. We do it for others, for others to see. And slowly that becomes a will to receive also and this is the point that is a little bit difficult to really process in this moment because you're thinking of the artist as giving as just uh, producing but in this moment there is also a will to receive there is uh, something inside the artist that is receiving in order to give again in a different way. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but I'm just trying to give a structure. So I'm understanding now that these phases, also in Kabbalah, are not so distinct. It's not phase one, phase two, phase three. They merge, they come together. And this is also what happens in the painting. There are parts of the painting that in the inspiration may already take into account part of the drawing and there may be parts in the drawing that derive from an inspiration and they may also create more inspiration so the phases are quite flexible we we don't really need to look at them in terms of you know one distinct step after another but it's good to understand them in this way 
if I can talk about it a little differently, there is this giving and receiving. I have an idea, I start to make an action onto the painting that is in response to that idea, and then the actual physical work comes back to me and gives me. Is it right? Is it wrong? Do I need correction? And so there is giving and taking. This is a little bit the light of Hasidim. It's the vessel that is being filled. It's like a clothing. And that clothing uh, will transform into a will to bestow, a will to give. Everyone has the will to receive, but it's this rediscovering of the creator that helps the artist or the creator to find this act of bestowal, which is similar to the creator. Mm -hmm.